Chapter 1. We must attempt an answer to the question of huge disparities between the lifestyles of people of different societies. Jared Diamond, while studying bird evolution in New Guinea in 1972, met a local politician named Yali. Yali asked, why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it to New Guinea, but we black people had little cargo of our own? This simple but difficult to answer question has been a puzzle to professional historians. There's no consensus on the answer. Some have stopped attempting an answer altogether. Guns, germs, and steel is Jared Diamond's attempt at an answer to Yali's question. Much of human history has consisted of unequal conflicts between the haves and the have-nots. Jared Diamond Since the end of the last ice age, the 13,000 years that followed divided the world along two large lines, literate industrial societies with metal tools and non-literate farming societies. Consequently, the modern world is a product of that division. The divide with the guns and steel have colonized and sometimes exterminated those without those metal tools. As of the year AD 1500, much of Europe, Asia, and North Africa were on the verge of industrialization. Conversely, the Aztecs and the Incas were still using stone tools. The political and technological differences at this time were responsible for the modern world's inequalities. Yet, we must investigate what led to the situation in AD 1500. Therefore, the question is why human development proceeded at different rates on different continents. This bite-sized book attempts an answer to this question because these disparate rates account for the broadest pattern of history. Beyond academic interest, we seek to understand the practical and political implications of the conquests, epidemics, and genocide that shaped the modern world. Most of the world's 6,000 surviving languages are being replaced by English, Chinese, and Russian. The dominance of Europe and North Africa is often attributed to superior intellect, physiology, and morality. But the evidence says otherwise. Geography, not biology, accounts for the gaps in power and technology between the two societies. The development of written language and the resistance of Eurasian to endemic diseases happened because of a confluence of cultures that resulted from commercial activities. When a city, for example, is a trade route, different people from all walks of life will converge there. Being gregarious, humans have a way of rubbing off on one another. This summary highlights some of the geographic, climatic, and environmental factors that enabled imperialism in stable, agricultural societies. It shows how guns, germs, and steel were the weapons used to subdue and sometimes exterminate those with less sophistication. Chapter 2. What were the factors that created great civilizations? Large population, sophisticated tools, and properly organized workforce are three factors that all great civilizations share in common. How were some societies able to gain access to these factors quickly while others did not? The Egyptians built the Great Pyramids at a time when the rest of mankind were hunter-gatherers. The Greeks, Romans, and Mayans are some other examples of early civilizations that had advanced technology. A closer look at the world before inequality began helps us to see why different societies began to develop at different rates. The earliest civilization is traceable to the Middle East, 13,000 years ago. During this time, the Middle East had more forest than arid land. Their primary occupation at the time was to form small mobile hunting groups. These hunters followed the direction of migration of the animals they hunted. One problem with this strategy was that it could only fetch them enough food for survival. To feed, they needed to have a successful hunt, a feat that was not guaranteed. Since hunting couldn't sustain them, they combined it with gathering. In Papua New Guinea, for example, women did the gathering. They would strip a sago tree to get the pulp at the center. Then they would make the pulp into dough and cook it. Though strenuous, the wild sago was a more stable source of feeding since the tree would not evade capture. A sago tree yields about 70 pounds of sago and takes about three days to process. There are not many sago trees in the forest. The sago can't be stored for a long period and it is low on protein. These limitations made it unfit for feeding a large population. By contrast, the forest in the Middle East had two cereal grasses growing between the trees, barley and wheat. They are nutritious and in abundant supply. It turns out that these crops will play a vital role in the march toward modern civilization, but they will get some help from climate change. Chapter 3. 
cereal crops and a volatile climate dictates lifestyle in the Middle East 12,500 years ago. There was a drop in global temperatures that made the world cold and dry. Animals, plants, and trees died off. It became harder to find food. People in the Middle East had to find a way to survive the environmental collapse. A Canadian archaeologist, Ian Koist, unearthed evidence of shelters and food storage sites that were more advanced than hunter-gatherer shelters. The inability to maintain their mobile way of life forced people in the Middle East to find a water source and plant wheat and barley around them. Effectively, the Middle East became the first people to embrace agrarian lifestyle. They domesticated the cereal crops in their forest by choosing to plant the biggest, tastiest, and easiest to harvest after each round of planting and harvesting. Humans began to control nature. As this practice of farming spread, civilization followed closely behind. Following the path of this spread explains why some parts of the world developed at a faster rate than others. The switch from hunting and gathering to farming changed the course of human history. China came along with rice, another cereal grass that could be stored for a longer period and had high yield. Some parts of the world developed farming on their own. In the Americas, there was evidence of corn, squash, and beans. Sorghum, millet, and yam came out of Africa. Yet, while advanced civilization followed farming in some parts of the world, the highlands of New Guinea have a different story to tell. Archaeological findings suggest that there had been farming in New Guinea at the time people in the Middle East had been farming. Yet, civilization did not advance at the same rate as it did in the Middle East, China, or Central America. Why? A few reasons have been identified. One is the type of crops they planted. The crops planted on the highlands of New Guinea were low in protein, could not be stored for a long time, and were difficult to plant. An example is the taro root. You have to plant the taro one by one while wheat can be planted by throwing your hand to spread the seed. The farmers who planted the most productive crops became the most productive farmers. It sounds almost incredible that the inequalities of the world came from the crops we grow and eat. The domestication of productive plants was not enough. Animals soon joined the fray. Chapter 4. 9,000 years ago, wheat and barley were supplemented by meat from domesticated animals. Five major animals stood out of the rest. Cow, goat, sheep, pig, and horse. Animals provided more than meat. They were a source of milk. Their hairs and skins were used to make clothes that kept people warm. Communities that had cereal crops and animals blossomed. Animal dung became a source of fertilizer while the animals could graze on the stubble after humans had harvested their crops. The entire process was beneficial for all parties involved. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the most sophisticated agricultural tools were beasts of burden. Farmers could grow more food by harnessing a horse or ox to a plow. Growing more food means being able to feed more people. Yali's people couldn't grow more food because they didn't have these beasts of burden. The pig was the only domesticated animal in New Guinea, and it wasn't even local. It came from Eurasia, Europe and Asia, a few thousand years ago. Pigs do not pull carts or plows. They cannot produce milk or generate leather. Why were the people of New Guinea unable to domesticate their own farm animals for farming? The animals that would be ideal for farming must have certain qualities. They must weigh at least 100 pounds and be herbivorous, plant eaters, mammals. They should produce offspring within two years and social animals. The males, females, and young should be able to live together with the social hierarchy. Social hierarchy means that the whole flock can be controlled by controlling the leader of the flock. Of the nearly 2 million species of wild animals, only 148 different species meet these criteria. Of these 148 species, only 14 have been successfully tamed by man. Goats, sheep, pigs, cows, horses, donkeys, Bactrian camels, Arabian camels, water buffalo, llamas, reindeer, yaks, mythens, and Bali cattle. None of these animals come from New Guinea, Australia, Sub-Saharan Africa, or North America. Only South America had the ancestor of the llama. All other 13 were either from Asia, North Africa, and Europe. Four of the big five domesticated animals, cows, pigs, sheep, and goats, were native to the Middle East. When you combine the best domestic animals with the best crops in a single location, it becomes clear why the Middle East became known as the Fertile Crescent. Did you know? Goats and sheep were the first animals to be domesticated by man. Chapter 5. Learning to forge steel was possible in communities that had enough food to eat. As the number of people in villages increased, some people could focus their attention on some other goals apart from farming. 
An example is the conversion of limestone to plaster. To heat the stones, the temperature had to be 1,000 degrees. The technique required to get fire to generate that temperature without going out of hand was the first step towards the making of steel. A 9,000-year-old archaeological site in Guar, southern Jordan, shows that houses had a form of air conditioning and were plastered from the inside. Interior plastering is an indication that people have advanced beyond having just shelter to building comfortable housing for themselves. Up until the 1960s in New Guinea, stone tools were still in use. They couldn't develop metal tools because no one could take a break from farming to develop those tools. When Westerners came to these climes, the technology they had developed were deployed to colonize the country. Today, however, it is not the first human civilization, the Fertile Crescent, that is the foremost civilization. A dry climate and a fragile ecology could not sustain the early intensive farming in the Middle East. About 1,000 years after their emergence, most of their villages were abandoned. An over-exploitation of the environment led to the degradation of the Middle East. Since they were providentially placed in the middle of a huge landmass, Eurasia, it was possible for farming to spread east and west along the same line of latitude. To the east, they had India, and to the west, they had North Africa and Europe. Any two points of the globe that shared the same latitude will also share the same length of day, similar climate, and vegetation. When the crops and animals of the Fertile Crescent reached Egypt, the result was an explosion of civilization. Up till the 16th century, there was no single cow or ear of wheat in all the Americas. European civilization, on the other hand, thrived because there was enough food to feed their artists, inventors, and soldiers. These food and crops came from the Fertile Crescent. It sounds incredible that distribution of wealth and power across the globe came down to goats, wheat, and barley. Did you know, there are 100 million cattle in the U.S. alone, and Americans consume 20 million tons of wheat per year. Chapter 6. Food security and access to beasts of burden created an enabling environment for the rapid development of Eurasian societies. When there is food security, it becomes possible to spend time doing something else. For Eurasian civilization, their transition from nomadic lifestyle to agrarian lifestyle was enhanced by certain factors. A vegetation rich in carbohydrates, a dry climate that favored food storage, access to animals that are easy to domesticate, and the capacity of these animals to survive captivity led to surplus supply of food. Once food was in surplus supply, people could afford to specialize in other activities that were not directly connected to sustenance and growth of the population. Consequently, they could develop social and technological solutions that complemented each other. From ruling classes and bureaucracies, they morphed into well-organized empires. Opportunity and necessity, not ingenuity, produced Eurasian civilization. Goats, sheep, and cattle are easy to domesticate and were in rich supply in Eurasia. There was barley, wheat, pulses that were rich in protein, and they could easily produce textiles from flax. These natural resources sorted their feeding and clothing needs. By comparison, American maize could not be stored for longer periods like the Eurasian grains. Tropical bananas could only last a couple of days before they began to decay. Through commercial activities of early Western Asian societies, they were able to find beasts of burden like horses and donkeys. These animals aided their transportation. While only one large animal could be domesticated in South America, Eurasia had at least 13 species of domesticated large animals that were over 45 kilograms. Extinction of large animals bedeviled Australia and North America after the Pleistocene. Yali's country, New Guinea, had only one domesticated animal that came from the East Asian mainland. Where Eurasia had horses and donkeys, Africa had zebras and onagers. While the African elephants could be tamed, they couldn't be bred in captivity. The Anna Karenina principle explains a feature of animal domestication that had heavy consequences for human history. Namely, that so many seemingly suitable big wild mammal species, such as zebras and peccaries, have never been domesticated, and that the successful domesticates were almost exclusively Eurasian. Jared Diamond The Anna Karenina principle was borrowed from Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina, where Tolstoy stated that happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Similarly, animals that could not be successfully domesticated had their peculiar reason that prevented their domestication. Chapter 7. Agricultural societies grow much faster than hunter-gatherer societies. The reason for this difference in growth rate is not exclusively agrarian. For example, there were societies that combined agrarian lifestyle with hunter-gatherer activities. 
They plant crops. While these crops grow, they depend on hunting for their survival. At harvest time, they return to their agrarian lifestyle. More so, embracing an agricultural lifestyle did not guarantee a better life. There were many farmers, and still are today, who grow food but are not living any better than those who opt for the nomadic lifestyle. We live in a world that functions on inequality. Those who sustain an advanced civilization with their work hardly get a corresponding reward for effort. By nature, agriculture produces more food per unit area than hunting does. Since farmers could feed more mouths, they procreated more readily. The sheer force of their population made it easier for them to crush hunter-gatherers. This agrarian power made agriculture more appealing to different societies across the world. Despite this appeal, some environments favored certain types of plants more than others. When the favorable plants are foods that could be stored for long without spoiling, the result would be enough food to sustain a larger population. Farming sustained between 10 to 100 times the population that hunting and gathering could sustain. The large population size of farming societies helped them to develop immunity to diseases that needed a large population to sustain themselves. An example is measles. Since these agrarian communities could produce new babies quicker than hunting communities, they were able to prevent the disease from exterminating them. These new babies could contract the disease from adults who had developed immunity to the disease. In less than 200 years, about 20 million Native Americans that populated North America had reduced to just 5% of their original population due to infectious diseases. Mexican crops finally began to reach the eastern United States by trade routes after AD 1. Corn arrived around AD 200, but its role remained very minor for many centuries. Jared Diamond It was just not agriculture that helped Eurasian societies. Their geographic axis played its part. For the Americas and Africa, their landmass goes from north to south. Europe and Asia have a latitudinal landmass. Their axis is an east-west axis. It is easier to travel along the east-west axis than the north-south axis. The ease of travel allowed ideas and innovations to spread rapidly. Also, the similarity in latitude resulted in similar climate and time zones. For example, all tropical rainforests are within 10 degrees of latitude of the equator. Did you know, more than 50% of the food choices available today are from cereal crops. Chapter 8. No race is superior to the other. What matters is the hand they have been dealt. There are smart, resourceful, and dynamic people everywhere. Despite the cultural differences, every society is laden with potential. Actualizing that potential depends on the environment and the raw materials available to do so. While Europe got cows, sheep, goats, or horses, New Guineans acquired pigs. Instead of wheat and barley, they got bananas that could be stored for a long period. Expanding this explanation to other continents, we find that the same geographical factors separated the winners from the losers. 168 Spaniards invaded the Incas in 1532, and in one day killed 7,000 people without losing a single Spaniard. These Spaniards were adventurers, led by a retired army captain, Francisco Pizarro. Pizarro's crew were the first Europeans to climb the Andes and enter into South America. The Incas saw the conquistadors riding on horses as gods. They had never seen men carried by animals before, even though the horses had been used in Spain for 4,000 years at this time. Pizarro's roots showed that he was an ordinary man from an ordinary town in Spain called Trujillo. Yet the reason he and his team of adventurers and merchants appeared to be like gods to the Incas provides an explanation for why the Europeans were able to successfully conquer the world. European farms were filled with livestock by the 16th century, and these livestock provided meat, milk, wool, leather, manure, and muscle power. None of these livestock were native to Europe. They were brought several thousand years earlier from the Fertile Crescent. While the Incas skillfully grew corn and potatoes, they had to do it manually. They didn't have horses or oxen to pull plows and increase productivity. Before cars were invented, horse riding helped people to move more quickly. The New World didn't have horses like the Europeans did. By the 16th century, a style of horse riding known as jimeta was well known to the Spanish cavalry. The jimeta emphasizes control and maneuverability. With one hand on the reins and knees gripping the sides of the horse, one man could control a large animal. This technique was originally learned to work with bulls, but soon became useful for military purposes. Chapter 9 at Texalpa, the Incan emperor was unaware the conquistadors had sophisticated weapons and it would cause his downfall. For more than 700 years before the conquistadors crossed the Andes, the Spaniards had been fighting against the Moors from the Fertile Crescent and other armies in Europe. 
These battles forced Spain to become the biggest army in Europe by fortifying their arsenal. Their weapons were highly advanced. An example was a crude gun known as the Jacobus. Gunpowder from China was first used as a weapon by the Arabs. Europeans morphed the technology into the Jacobus, which was a lighter and portable gun. When Atexalpa heard that gods that were half-human, half-beast had entered their land, he devised a scheme to lure them into a trap. He sent Pizarro's team presents and asked them to come to Cajamarca, where he was guarded by an army of 80,000 men. His spies didn't know that the small company of Spaniards had weapons they had never seen in their life. The gun was the newest addition to the Spaniard arsenal at this time. They had something else, a sword. The gun needed time to reload it and had a poor aim. The military captain of Spain, Toledo, had developed a Toledo sword. Steel had not only been produced, but also made into swords. In fact, Toledo had some of the best swordsmith in the world by 1532. The development of swords was a high point in metalworking technology. The sword could stab, slash, and kill dozens of people in a short time. One type of sword, the rapier, became a fashionable sword in Renaissance Europe. It became a symbol of self-advancement for gentlemen in the 16th century. It was strapped to the side of their civilian dress as they went about their daily business. It was this lust for self-advancement that inspired the expedition of Pizarro and his men. At first, they were scared at the sight of the beautiful Incan camp. Then, Pizarro decided to send a party led by Captain de Soto into the Incan camp, fearing that they might be captured and killed. What chance did 168 men about 1,000 miles away from their kinsmen stand against 80,000 Incas? Did you know, the word rapier is from the Spanish root espara rapera, and it means dress sword. Chapter 10. The development of writing was another factor that favored Europe's dominance. Pizarro, having read of the conquest of Hernan Cortes over the Aztecs 12 years earlier, decided to borrow his surprise attack tactic. The existence of writing offered this edge. Had Pizarro not read about what Cortes did, he might not have been able to know what to do. The Incans transmitted knowledge via oral memory, while the Spaniards already had libraries. The development of writing is extremely complex and could only have been achieved by those who didn't need to worry about sustenance. Writing was first achieved by the Sumerian people of the Fertile Crescent about 5,000 years ago. They developed what is called the cuneiform, a complex system of symbols used to record farming transactions. Every other written language of Eurasia was developed from the cuneiform. The invention of paper and ink had a great influence on the spread of writing. These inventions were made outside Europe, but were seized upon by Europeans to produce the printing press. It would have been impossible to have the modern world without the development of writing. Meanwhile, a new system of writing was invented independently about 2,500 years ago in southern Mexico. These symbols evolved into the Mayan script, but the shape of the continents did not allow this invention to spread to the Andes to help the Incans gain literacy. Eurasia and the Americas are two continents of about the same length, 8,000 miles. Whereas Eurasia's 8,000 miles spread from east to west, the Americas are from north to south, almost a 90-degree rotation of each other. Traveling from north to south is a journey that lasted different day lengths, different climate zones, and different vegetation because of the differences in the lines of latitude. Consequently, crops, animals, ideas, and technology could not spread easily. The result is a chronic isolation of the people of the American continent. The Spaniards subdued the Incas with just about 168 horse riders. Geography was the single factor that gave them this undue advantage. Their east-west landmass paved the way for networking and exchange of technology with people who shared similar length of day and vegetation. Did you know, the Great Library of Salamanca University of Northern Spain still has the documentation of Cortez's exploits in Mexico. Chapter 11. Unbeknownst to the Spaniards, they were carriers of infectious diseases to which their bodies were immune. When another team of Spaniards explored Mexico in the 16th century, one of the slaves had smallpox. Through him, the smallpox virus spread to infect thousands of Native Americans. The smallpox epidemic decimated Native populations and made them easy prey. This spreading of diseases was one-sided because people like Pizarro had developed resilience against infectious diseases. Their rearing of animals had exposed them to the germs which their bodies had developed immunity against. They drank germs in their milk, breathed in the germs from domestic animals like pigs, cows, sheep, and goats. The diseases that kill humans originate from the germs of domestic animals. 
Measles came from cattle. Smallpox came from domestic animals. Flu came from pigs. The Eurasian people have a 10,000-year history of contact with these animals. Millions of lives had been claimed in the Middle Ages, and the few that survived after each outbreak produced offspring that were genetically better at fighting off these viruses. The Incans and the Aztecs did not share this history. Therefore, they were susceptible to these diseases. They had no natural immunity and could easily spread the disease within their population. While the Incans had the llama, it is unlike other domestic animals. There was no significant exchange of germs between people and llamas because it was not milked, not kept in large herds, and didn't live close to where people lived. Europeans conquered the rest of the world, not because of their bravery, but because they were the first people to acquire guns, germs, and steel. The capture of Attic's Alpa weakened the strength of the Incan Empire. Pizarro made an empty promise to release him in exchange for gold. After gaining 20 tons of gold with Atexalpa's help, he was no longer useful to his captors. He was killed at the same square where many of his followers were killed. Consequently, the conquistadors colonized the rest of Peru. Did you know, flu evolved from a disease of pigs transmitted via chickens and ducks. Chapter 12 Once they were able to conquer the Indians and the Mexicans, Europeans attempted to conquer the world. In the mid-1600s, Europeans entered into Africa through the southernmost tip of the continent, the Cape of Good Hope. Even though South Africa is 5,000 miles from Europe, it falls on a similar latitude as Europe. Therefore, it had similar temperature and climate to Europe. They were able to plant wheat and barley and raise their animals there. The natives were driven from their lands. The original inhabitants were the Khoisan people. From the south, they expanded to other parts of Africa. The gun technology was perfected. Dutch farmers carried them for protection and invasion of new territories. These Dutch farmers were called Voortrekkers. By February 1838, they had expanded inland from the Cape for about 800 miles. Suddenly, they met catastrophe that took the lives of 300 Voortrekkers. They had entered into Zulu territory. They didn't expect the ferocious Zulu defense system. In retaliation, the Boers decided to use their technology to maximum effect. In what came to be known as the Battle of the Blood River, the Zulus lost about 3,500 soldiers, while the Vortrekkers suffered only three injuries. Since the world had entered into the Industrial Revolution at this time, railroads were constructed for transporting people and supplies over long distances. Also, the Maxim gun was made. It could fire 500 rounds in a minute. No African tribe could match this weaponry. At the crossing near River Limpopo, there is the geographical boundary between the temperate region and the tropics. As the Europeans traveled northwards, geography worked against them. Their horses and oxen died and their plants didn't grow. They had crossed the Tropic of Capricorn and left the temperate regions behind. The tropical region they entered into didn't favor them. Here, there are two seasons instead of four. Additionally, indigenous diseases that they had not been exposed to killed off many of these Europeans. Linguistic analysis reveals that the linguistic similarities in African languages is because they all originated from a family of languages called Bantu in tropical West Africa. Some archaeological findings show that Africa had an amazing great history that dates back 5,000 years before any white set foot in Africa. At a site known as Mapungudwe, the place of the jackal, there are signs that show that it was the capital of a massive state. Conclusion Geography blessed Europeans with the most productive crops and animals on the planet. Once they had food, they could invest their time developing steel and guns. Also, their interaction with animals like pigs, cows, horses, and cattle helped them to develop immunity against many infectious diseases. These Europeans ventured into new lands and territories. When they met people from other societies, they had the upper hand because their weapons were more sophisticated than those of the people they met. They also infected their new friends, subjects, with diseases they were immune to. African cattle had developed resistance to tropical germs. European cattle couldn't survive. African people had developed antibodies against malaria. Europeans couldn't beat malaria. At Mapungudwe, there is evidence that showed that the first African settlers had cattle, sheep, and surplus food to feed the city. They grew sorghum, millet, and worked iron. The Europeans couldn't settle tropical Africa's land like they did North and South America. Yet, they couldn't resist the appeal of the reserves of natural resources like diamonds, gold, and copper. Belgians were brutal in their attack of the Democratic Republic of Congo in the late 1800s. 
They forced the Africans to work in mines where they ferried Africa's natural wealth back to Europe. Today, the aftermath of the invasion of Europeans is still felt in most African countries, despite their independence from colonization. Their lifestyles have been altered permanently. Malaria, that they were once immune to, is now the number one killer in Africa. Eminent economists say that the 1% negative growth each year in Africa is attributable to malaria. Taking a cue from Malaysia and Singapore, we find hope. These are countries that share a similar climate with tropical Africa. Yet, in the last half century, they have radically transformed themselves by understanding their environment. Try this. By knowing what happened in the past and why, we are empowered to change things today to get different results in the future. Are you in a position to change things? Realize that the smallest of details can alter the course of a person's life. In your own way, contribute to the fight against endemic diseases, hunger, and poverty in parts of the world that are impoverished by lack of access to opportunity.